Do you feel like there's a different standard for women if this female can go out on the course and basically be coming to from yoga class, why can't I wear my bathing suit? Hey everybody, thanks for being here. This is episode number 62 of No Putts Given. We've got Harry, Chris, and Tony here. And guys, I want to get right into it because we were talking before the show about this one particular issue and it made me mad and I'm in for a fight now. I want to know, should golf have a dress code? And Harry, can you start us off with this ridiculous rule that they have in England about the color of your dang socks? Yeah, if you go to a nightclub in England... Well, at least when I went, it was black shoes, black socks. You couldn't wear shorts in the on I on you Saturdays. Said at the golf course. Oh, and golf Did course. Did you say nightclub or nice club? So here's the <laughs> here's the thing: it, it, golf clubs, you have to wear white socks. You cannot wear black socks. They have they can't go above the ankles, unless it's if unless it's a full the old school one where you're in Scotland and you have to the long socks that go up to your knees and you tuck your your trousers into your socks. That is a real thing, yeah. And if you want to go nightclubbing, they have the same kind of bloody thing where you have to wear black shoes and black socks in some nightclubs. Just okay. weird. We're weird. Yeah, we get it. So it begs again my original question. Should there be a dress, call, a dress code in golf? No, that, 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 that time is dead, in my opinion. I mean, the hard part is you got to draw the line somewhere. You know, because the the lowest common denominator, right, of humanity, like if you say, hey, no dress code whatsoever, um, you can probably get away with that at a, at, a, at a very exclusive private course, right, where, you know, you, you have like kind of one club rule and it's, you know, do the right thing and, and there's enough people that kind of have similar sensibilities around that that they will um, and no one's going to really push the boundaries too far. But I think kind of more what we're talking about is what can we expand that range of dress that that is deemed appropriate? Like right now, it seems like there's such a narrow, narrow band of when we say, OK, a dress code, um, you know, people have this idea probably of what country club casual looks like or what would be acceptable golf attire and basically how far can we expand that definition of acceptable golf attire um and and do we think we need to expand that definition i'd say absolutely part of what harry was referencing um uh, uh ewan porter or ewan porter uh from australia had a situation yesterday or a couple days ago where you know black uh socks black shoes wasn't allowed to play i think ultimately ended up getting him banned from the club i believe like can it can never come back kind of band or just had to go home for the day and change and come back like you're in high school and you're short like you're short yeah like I you know I I only had that problem once in high school and you know <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say that's probably not something any of you experienced <laughs> but the point is you know is is that too restrictive and and there's really two points here and and I'd love to get people's thoughts on this is yeah if you're a private club you can make whatever rules you want. But that doesn't excuse you from the fact that the rules may be seen as ridiculous or too constrictive by other people. So, yeah, can a club say, yes, you can only wear purple socks? Sure, I'm sure they could. Um, but to what end and what uh, what purpose does that serve? And ultimately, what do you think about it? You know, Tony, if a club said you can only come play here if you wear purple socks, would you wear purple socks? It depends how nice the golf course was. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh you know, I'm I'm a big proponent of the idea that every golf course should have two rules, and that's basically respect the course and don't do anything that impedes on someone else's good time. Um, and from there, ideally, you would hope that within that, everyone would use sensible judgment about what to wear and, and what not to wear. Um, and of course, within that, there's a gray area of, hey, well, you know, seeing somebody in a hoodie... <laughs> forces me to not have a good time or whatever ridiculous argument you want to make. But I think Chris is right. Like if it, if it comes down to hoodies, that's, that's pretty silly. And I think, I think blue jeans is even pretty silly. You know, if you want to get into, Hey, you know, cut off denim shorts and tank tops. Yeah. Okay. Maybe, maybe that somewhere in that area is where you draw the line, especially if those shorts are cut really, really short, but, um, no jorts allowed. <laughs> yeah. I just, I just feel like, and, and now things are a little bit different because with, with the COVID boom courses have 
pretty packed tee shots in a lot of play in a lot of cases. But I mean, for so long we were hearing about how golf is dying and, and how tee sheets are empty. And I'm like, well, well, Jesus. Yeah. Okay. Maybe cargo court shorts aren't, aren't the coolest, best looking things, but you know, ultimately are they hurting anything? Plus it's, you know, if you got like tees and divot tools, it's, I was going to you know, say they're there's, utility. There's, there is, there is a function. Yeah. <laughs> Who needs a golf bag when you've got a pocket for your, your, your golf balls, your tees and a couple of snacks here and there. I, yeah, I mean, most of us carry some form of cargo on the golf course. So. <laughs> <laughs> Harry, what do you think about the hoodie? I feel like you're going to be a fan of the hoodie on the golf course. I love the hoodie. I, I think it's, the way golf should be. I mean, in England, it's... Mandated hoodies. Yeah. In England, it's very traditional. And excuse me for saying this, but those people who made those rules are actually dying off, literally. Um, <laughs> I didn't mean to laugh. So, so, that, so that... <laughs> people are dying. <laughs> <laughs> those, those, tra- those traditionalists are now moving on and the younger people are coming through. And at the end of the day, it's the golf course is trying to keep its reputation for keeping you need white socks here and blah 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 like that is just absolute bs in my opinion this new generation of hoodies i think is great i would i wear a hoodie maybe i've played in a hoodie once or twice and i don't like it slapping me in the back when it wishes around like that i don't i don't like that as much it distracts me but if people want to play in it great i think that's just fine i don't have a problem with it I, i'll play in i'll play in tights sometimes you know typically yeah. not under shorts but on but i have you know you start out like cold morning it's you know nike was doing the tights thing for a while leggings like, leggings you know, say leggings, leggings. yeah don't say like tights. like They're long tights. johns are you talking like long johns i'm i'm talking like spandex form <laughs> fitting did you say not under shorts <laughs> yeah i've 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 worn them under shorts i've worn them you know oh, under pants gosh. not just you know I was going to say, so your junk is not coming out. <laughs> no, no, I haven't been out there in, in okay. just my, my leggings. But So I was going to say, you're not smuggling nuggets <laughs> that everyone can see. I got, Miranda, I have a question for you, though. So, because okay. a lot of times we focus this on, like, this issue that came up with the Black Sox. We tend to go right to, like, the male-dominated part of the mm-hmm. discussion. People kind of picture, like, none of us have said, oh, geez, that, that that's too revealing or something like that do you feel like there's a different standard or a different piece to the conversation for women given some of the um you know whether it's just trends uh you know obviously being a dad and having daughters i i don't love all of the fashion trends that i see (laughs) filtering down to the youth and and it's a constant battle sometimes because some of it just looks in my opinion trashy i just i just love that you use the phrase the youth (laughs) (laughs) the the youth of america what is going on with the youth today you know so like so like is is it is it a different thing because you have some people really promoting right like okay if if this female can go out on the course and basically be wearing not a whole lot or you know coming to from yoga class why can't i wear my bathing suit uh, well, see here. I don't know. I I'll say when I go golf with Harry, I do struggle to follow the dress code because for me, I grew up an athlete. So I just have an, a different idea that if I'm going to go do something athletic or physical to me, the golf attire is somewhat restrictive and uncomfortable. So it's almost a distraction. Sometimes I'm also not the type of girl that would go out in a golf skirt because that to me is just isn't athletic either so for me it's like can we ride the line of athleticism and still maintain the respect for the course that tony said so do i think females going out and in leggings without putting it under their shorts that's pretty mainstream nowadays Uh you know i i don't see any problem with athletic leggings on the course but it is i'm sure most guys don't either you know, I, th- I think it's, I found it interesting when you mentioned like growing up an athlete and being an mm-hmm. athlete. And so this is, you know, how you dress to engage in an athletic pursuit, whatever it happens yep. to be. And collars and, were not a thing. Right. Like, and you so didn't wear collars to be athletic because they got in the way. And so if you think back, right, this idea of, of golfers as legitimate powerhouse athletes in like, like Brooks Kepka and the way you know, Rory had changed his physique over the last several years and what Bryson's doing and just go on and on down the list of, of these golfers now who, who 
legitimately you could put them into the playing field of another sport and they wouldn't look out of place. And you compare mm-hmm. that to, to what the game looked like you know, decades plus ago where, if we're being honest, golfers for the most part didn't look like what we expect athletes to look. And so, mm-hmm. you know, sort of as, as the athlete has changed, it probably makes sense for the other elements of the game, including the, the dress code, to, to adapt to that reality. Yeah, at some point in time, you stopped wearing a shirt and tie, right, and plus fours to play golf. And at some point in time, that was the only thing that was acceptable. And and it's like, how far have we moved? And there's always going to be that bucking convention and trend, and and it's always going to be uncomfortable for the people that don't want don't want to see that change. But I think that's the challenge, right? Of how can you honor those traditions to whatever end that is or looks like and means? But then at the same time, you know, answer the question: Do you want your course to be? welcoming what type of look feel and tenor do you want it to have and absolutely private courses can do whatever they want in that regard um you know so long as they're abiding by all the laws and and rules of the land but um at the same time i i I struggle with the message of hey we want to grow the game we want to be inclusive we want to be welcoming and you can only wear white socks like those are augusta those that's where we need to go yeah that that's the part that's the part where i get fired up and struggles like yeah we love having kids here we want to do it and they can play tuesday afternoons after 4 p.m so (laughs) anyway it sounds like we're all fans of golf modernizing in many ways the dress code being one of them so moving on last week philip bishop um our director of hard goods put together a really awesome article for all of the golf parents out there he took a a very broad look at the entire junior clubs market and gave everybody a list of the best junior clubs available to parents with um, kids that they want to develop their golf game but here's one thing that i want to pull you guys on junior clubs maybe much like women's clubs might just be another way that OEMs can make money. So is this another marketing arm for big OEMs or are they really designed to help your kids grow and develop in the game of golf? Chris, why don't you start? You have seven kids. Yeah. (laughs) Yes, I do. That is a true statement. (laughs) Um, Therefore, I'm the authority on all things youth, uh, apparently, in this episode. And female kids. (laughs) And female kids. What are the female youth engaged in today? Here's here's what the female youth of America want. Um, No, it's both. It's it's one of those things where I think it's really it's really good from two perspectives. One, you know, we know it's hard to find growth uh, areas in golf, right? Especially if you're in a challenger position or looking to try and gain market share in any type of meaningful way. We talked about this a little bit with uh, some drivers and the driver names last, uh, the last edition where it's tough, right? It's, you're not going to shift certain tides and market dynamics overnight. So companies are constantly looking for new and different ways to find growth pockets. Um, And I think much like uh, women's clubs uh, that, that, Having dedicated junior and youth sets is absolutely a place where there isn't necessarily a title holder, right? In the in the industry, it's not like something pops to mind and says, "Oh my gosh, that is the company that dominates this space." Maybe it was U.S. Kids. There you go. Well, when you said who dominates, that's that's what popped into my head immediately. U.S. Kids. Yeah. It's- it's the only one I can think of. So um, you seem like with Prodigy stuff, uh, Ping has had kind of a renewed emphasis on that as you're seeing other companies do that as well. I think it's an absolutely great thing for OEMs because it, it presents them a growth opportunity. Also, we're seeing new and more players theoretically, right, with kind of this COVID boom to the industry. And um, I think it's good on both counts. Tony, how about you? We haven't tested junior clubs per se, but what do you think – we would find if we did do you think we'd find some quality engineering in them yeah i I think i think you find companies that that treat kids clubs as unique things right like these are designed for kids and you probably have some companies who say yeah this is a kid club and we we just took our our big club and and made it smaller and that's not to say it can't work because it is a lot it's a lot like the argument for the women's clubs to a degree right the the whole idea is well, the, the physicality is different, so you need shorter and lighter. And again, it's it's how you engineer that and how you do that does absolutely matter. So I think some brands, um, I like what Ping does. Chris mentioned the prodigy and the idea that to an extent the clubs can grow with your kids because that's in the junior space. That's 
that's the thing that that can really trip parents up it's like hey all right i bought this set the kid used it twice and and now she's too big for it and i need to go lather rinse repeat and do it again and a year or two later you do it again so you know having having the a system that allows your your clubs to grow with the kid isn't half bad and i think i think from a you know positioning standpoint and you know why why companies do it i think it's like anything else, right? The the earlier you can get somebody into your brand, excited about your brand, using your brand, the hope is that that as a golfer progresses from from junior to you know sort of regular size golfer and, and potentially even <laughs> to an elite level, that they stick with your brand. So you know, mm-hmm. a, a great example. To, Taylor made with the Rory set, right? If you can get a 10 year old into that set, when, when you find the next Colin Morikawa, for example, if he's been playing your brand since he was 10 kind of situation, if that happens, like that guy is, you're going to have the advantage in signing that guy, getting him on your roster and, and keeping him because he, you've built an identity with, with an individual. So opportunities, like Chris said. Harry, you started golfing when you were 12, right? Mm-hmm. So did you play junior clubs, obviously, when you were when you were first starting? Yeah, I mean, I was about two feet tall when I was 12 too, <laughs> so it was struggle to play anything other than junior clubs. Now, in England, we had, it was called a young gun set, so it was based on your um, your height, so if you were a certain height, you would play this color, basically just like US kids is what I'm guessing. I actually transitioned into a ladies set because the men's were too big for me. Um, the junior section, I think, is very important, as I do the ladies section. I don't think it's more of a a money grabber. I think it, it, it is a little bit, but it's more of, hey, let's get more people involved at a young age. And it's kind of an investment, right? You're investing in golfers. Yeah, I would. That's mm-hmm. exactly what I would say. It's an investment. So quickly, Harry, since you're in the facility every day. What would your one piece of advice to parents who are looking to start their kid in a set of clubs be? I would I would probably do half a set at first. If you're if they're just starting, get them like a pitch and wedge slash nine nine. So just get them involved in golf. And if they take a take it off, then you can potentially go into a full set. And in assist do a great um, start set where you do a pitch and wedge nine nine, where you can just put the ball back in your stance and it changes it into a nine nine. Get them involved, get them excited about golf, and it could just be by getting them half a set of clubs and just say, go have some fun, go hit some balls, see if you like it, and we can go from there. Yeah, I would I would add, like, I wouldn't sweat necessarily the, the a perfect fitting out of the yeah. gate. or It was just you know, the length. Yeah, I mean, uh, you, you can get away with the bare minimum early. The, the key thing is to get your kids to love the game. You know, if that happens, the rest you can kind of navigate through. But you know, step one is is letting the kid have fun and and discover the game and and kind of love it on their own. Yeah, and I think for me, a good way to do that is to involve them in the process, even if mm-hmm. it's you know, however you can, if it's helping them pick out the set, if you narrow it down to two or three or, or, you know, give them some ownership over what, what you're getting or doing. And and they already kind of then see it as their set as something that, that they're getting, you know, I, I'll never forget when my dad, when I was little and I don't know if the seventh, eighth grade went to, you know, pick out a new baseball bat for the summer. And it, it, it made a huge difference to me because I got to help pick it out and therefore it was mine. Um, so I think, you know, then, then the kids see it as, as something that's theirs. Maybe they want to take care of them a little bit better, whatever the case is, they have ownership over it, you know? And, and so I would say parents involve your kids in the process, you know, let them play a role, um, in, in that decision. And, and like Tony said, if, if you, if you engage them and you keep it fun, that, you know, that's probably the two places I see parents swing and miss most often. So good advice. All right. I like a little parenting advice on no putts given here. <laughs> I have no such thing of parenting advice. Tony and I have learned a lot because <laughs> we've screwed up a lot. That's how we learn. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> okay, so moving on. The last thing I want to do is play a game of sorts. Do you want to play a game? 
<laughs> I don't know if I do anymore. <laughs> the game is called Like It or Leave It or Love It or Leave It. You can decide what level of emphasis you want to put on it. But essentially, <laughs> all I'm going to do is present an idea or a topic to you. And each one of you gets to tell me whether you love it or you want to leave it. And if it needs a sentence of explanation, that's fine. Otherwise, I'm putting you on the spot. Are we ready? I love it. Our first topic, Bryson DeChambeau is going to win the Masters. Harry, love it or leave it? Love it. Tony? Love it. Chris? Absolutely love it. All right. I'm kind of surprised that that was your answer. Uh, Tony, why'd you say love it real quickly? I, I just think what he's doing is great for the game. Although I will say some of the petulant nonsense that, that just keeps coming up like, oh, just like, just like when I'm like, yeah, you know what? I really do like this guy. There's always something I'm like, mother again. So, <laughs> but Have I you taken like enough him. pictures? I, I would love to see him thrash Augusta. Yeah. All right. I like it. Um, Vice golf balls. Chris, love them or leave them? Leave them. Ooh, Tony? Leave them. Harry? I would leave them. All three of you. Okay, Chris, you were pretty adamant. Why are we leaving them? Um, because ultimately, uh, at its core, no pun intended, it's, you know, it's a lifestyle thing. Um, so for me, I'm, I'm more concerned about performance and it's, it's effectively the same ball that I can get from three or four other manufacturers just under a different name. It's a generic, uh, performance for me. It's kind of a middle of the road generic performance and there's a lot of, the branding is awesome. The logo I really like. I think they've done a phenomenal job selling the product in that regard. But from a performance standpoint, there's just a lot. I mean, there's far more better options out there. All right. Next topic is graphite shafts in irons. Tony, love it or leave it? Love it. Harry? Hell yeah. Chris? Leave it. Ooh, okay. The dissenter. Why are we leaving it? Because we've all agreed so far on everything and I had to do something <laughs> different to shake it up. Um, <laughs> yeah, okay, but, Harry, why do we love it? <laughs> I, I bet you can, you can go lighter in graphite but still have the same firmness and the same layering as a steel shaft. Uh, I, play, I play graphite irons now and I, my dispersion got tighter my can my ball striking got more consistent i i really 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 like it and i think that's the future all right so the last thing i have here i'm not exactly sure how to phrase it but callaway put out some new blades earlier um this week i think i want to know should pros even be playing blades so let's love or leave the question should we ask pros harry if they should be playing blades no yeah, I don't think it's necessary. I think it's good for the game for them to use whatever they want. Tony, how about you? We're challenging pros to not play blades. Love it or leave it? Um, leave it. It's it's an argument we'll never win. You know, it okay. is interesting, right? I will point out that several years ago, I mean, TaylorMade is a classic case where they they made an attempt to to get a lot of their tour guys out of blades into these compact cavity backs for just that little bit of performance advantage and it it just didn't take and so you know you you have golfers are they're set in their ways even at the professional level like in in the when we did the ball round table Alan Hocknell said it best right they're they're open to new technology and new things as long as it does exactly the same thing as what they already have <laughs> and so right. you know right. you know talk to me in a decade right when you have a generational shift i think you will ultimately see left blades but it's not a battle anybody's going to win right now chris what do you think love it or leave it i leave it i just i i, I leave it it's 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 just one of those things where, like I said, you're, you're not necessarily going to win anything there. There's something, you know, like Kevin Nas on record, he may, maybe it was even a little tongue-in-cheek, but basically saying, you know, hey, I'm not good enough to play Blades. I'm sure Kevin was being very honest, but I, I would also assert that he probably is good enough to play Blades if he really wanted to. I think he's probably a solid enough ball striker, but, but there's something there that he doesn't want to, right? So there's these nuances that matter to tour players that – um you are different for us. I think, I don't know, Tony, you'd remember this maybe. Was it Victor Hovland last year that basically like flipped his iron set with ping and went with like the more forgiving 
element like in the lower irons and the less forgiving one like in the in the longer irons for a period of time or something we may have to I fact check that know but what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> but you i think you know you know who doesn't play blades who this bryson. guy bryson doesn't bryson doesn't i think you're gonna see a shift i do i mean there's as they can you know really functionally what's the difference between like a uh player's cavity back and a true muscle back mizuno would tell you with their with the mp18s right that's part of the reason they got rid of the sc uh, was because the, the the split cavity and the muscle back were virtually the same club um, from a performance and CG and, and MOI perspective. So they got rid of one. There's too much overlap. So really the functional difference between the two isn't much, um, but you're not going to win that one. So I'm not going to ask. All right. Um, my last question, Chris, do you feel different with the hoodie up? Uh, Yeah. Feel a little bit darker. Feel. <laughs> yeah, it's just like. It occurred to me like it. That's a Hanma hoodie, so yeah, that's like a, a Japanese brand kind of rooted in these in <laughs> traditions, right? And and here you are with a, with a I don't. I felt some irony there. I that's part of the reason I wore it. Yeah, I feel like I should bust out a couple rhymes. That's kind of what I feel like. But do it real fast. I don't have any yet. Okay. I'm still right. wor- I'm still working <laughs> on that part of my persona. What we do have, though, um, if you're interested in five ways to increase your driver distance, you can check out this video. Um, we break it down for you pretty simply. So until then, we out.